this amazing grace this morning that reaches down to old sinners like you and old sinners just like me. A popular philosophy in our world today based on all of the false teaching about evolution that uh, man is on his way up. But you and I, this morning, if we take an honest look at what's going on in our world, we quickly realize that man is not on the way up. The truth is, uh, man is a creature who has suffered from a devastating fall. And when you look at man, you find that his basic nature is not good, but evil in all of its ways. In fact, uh, the innermost being uh, of man has been disoriented by sin. And what do you mean disoriented? I mean, God has got his focus off God and, and the creator and on this world and himself. The Bible confronts us with this disturbing fact here in the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. But it not only confronts it, us with it here, but you'll find it continuing throughout the pages of God's word. And then when we get right down at the very end of the record that God gives us, we are given the direst warnings concerning the consequences of hu human sin. You'll never be able to understand human nature. Somebody said, I just can't understand why men do what they do. I I, I, I was reading an article this week about, uh, you probably have seen the news about this woman killing her children and they are buried them in the backyard. I, I read another article about a, a, a child that was found in a home that was uh, 10, 11, 12 years of age, weighed only 70 pounds where the parents had literally, as she died, had starved her to death. And somebody said, I, I just don't, I can't understand why people would do that. Well, you're never going to understand human nature if you fail to take into account the most basic of all the laws of human nature, and that is the law of sin that we read about here in Genesis chapter 3. Last Sunday morning, we began our look at what I believe, as I said a little early, the most tragic chapter in all the Bible. And what we learned as we began our look into this chapter is that sin did not begin on earth. In fact, it began in a very strange place. It began in heaven. Of all places that sin would begin, sin began in heaven. In fact, sin did not originate in the heart of a human being, but it had its source in the very heart of an angelic being. One of the archangels, Lucifer, son of the morning. And as we come to Genesis chapter 3, as that sin entered the Garden of Eden, we find that it was fully grown. Introduced there by Satan, who was disguised as a serpent. And as we read the first five chapter, verses of this chapter, we uh, talked about four satanic lies that ruined the world. Uh, they were prevalent then and they're prevalent today. The devil li lied about the goodness of God, the truthfulness of God, the righteousness of God, and the graciousness of God. And with that lie, he deceived man and led him into sin. Let me mention this as a matter of Bible trivia this morning. Some of you like trivia. Let me, get, let me give you a, a little bit of Bible trivia this morning. Three chapters in from the beginning of the Bible, the, certain, the serpent appears for the first time. Three chapters in from the end of the Bible, he's seen for the last time. And then sandwiched in between Genesis 3 and three chapters from the end of the book, we see the sad and tragic results of his work on practically every page of God's Word. I don't have to look into the world. I can and see his work there. But in the word of God, we see him working again and again and again. 
This morning, I want us to take just a few moments and look again here in Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 6 through 15 for our text this morning and again this evening. And I, I hope you'll keep your Bible mark there and plan on being here this morning and about, uh, uh, back tonight because you're not going to get the full picture. I started out with one message here, and that message grew and grew. It's sort of like, it's sort of like yeast in the pot. The longer it sat, the bigger it got. And uh, I've been doing this long enough to know that Baptists can only digest so much. You know, their, their digestion of the Bible ends somewhere around 12 o'clock, Brother Larry. And so if you're going to feed them more bread after that, you, you, you're wasting your time. You just well try to hold up and give it to them next time. So we're going we're gonna to look at a little bit of negative this morning and then finish up on the positive. How many of you like positive things? Well, I'll be back tonight. Uh, this negative will help you to understand and appreciate the positive in a greater way. If you've got your Bible open or able to stand, I'm going to ask you to stand with me, reverencing, honoring the reading of God's Word. Genesis 3, look down at verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he, God, said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the reading of the Word of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, now give us insight into what we've read. Help us that the truths that are here would not, uh, not escape our minds and our hearts this morning. Lord, I, I want to ask you to help me this morning. I, my, my only desire in being here this morning is to be a help and a blessing. And I pray you'd use me, and I pray you'd speak to the heart of the, the, the need of, of every heart in this room this morning. Whether it's somebody who's not saved or somebody who's away from God, whether it's somebody who needs to be encouraged, I just ask you right now, in their heart, would you work? Help them to say yes to you in everything. And we'll leave here blessed this morning, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. I'm using for my sermon title this morning and, and again this evening the question that God summons Adam with. In our text here, uh, the words, uh, where art thou? God comes walking in the cool of the day as no doubt he has done many days prior to this day. And in those days he has enjoyed fellowship with Adam and Eve but as he comes this time, they're not to be found. They've hidden themselves. And the Lord cries out to them, where art thou? I believe that perhaps is the most significant, the most important question that God ever asked a man. I don't, I don't believe God could ever ask me a more important question than that in my... I don't believe God could ever ask you a more... In fact, I don't believe a more important question could ever be asked you than the question that God asked here, where art thou? 
insert your name in that. God was calling to Adam, but insert your name there. Because the same God who called Adam is the same God who's still calling to the hearts and lives of men today. Here in these verses, Adam and Eve are now about to discover the vital, the, the terrible, the awful truth of Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. As I studied this week, I came across a little piece of paper that I had written this down on, I don't know how many years ago now, many, many years ago, I heard a preacher say this. I, I had heard it often said before. You don't hear it often today, but I, I jotted it down. And, and uh, it, it simply says, life is short, death is sure, sin is the curse, and Christ is the cure. And that's a reality this morning. Our scripture this morning gives us the record of the curse of sin and the death it brings, and the cure that God has provided. All of that's found in the verses that we're looking at here this morning, the, the wonderful truths that are here. Thank God that, that it, it, it sets before us the marvelous truth of the life that the Lord Jesus provided for us in his death at Calvary, and the fact that we can be forgiven of our sin. I fear this morning we're living in a generation that has lost its fear of sin. I see that everywhere I look today, everywhere I go, I see folks who are concerned about this terrible virus, COVID-19, and, and rightfully so. I, I understand the, the fearfulness of that. I, 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 I've read the accounts. I, I, I have seen the effects. I, I have looked at the terrible things that have happened as a result uh, of this disease that has infected and still infects our land today. And I see folks taking every precaution, and again, rightfully so, that they can take not to be infected by this terrible disease. But I want to say to you this morning, there is another pandemic ravaging our land that hardly nobody is paying any attention to, and that is the pandemic of sin this morning. And masks won't protect you from that. Gloves won't protect you from that. Social distancing won't, won't help you in that. Quarantining won't help yourself in dealing with that. So we ought to fear sin as though it were a contagious disease, as though it were a rattlesnake coil to strike in our society. My heart grieves this morning as I see folks who have the idea that they can just dabble in sin, that they can dart into sin and out of sin and get away with it with no lasting effects in their life at all. I want to beg you this morning for just a few minutes to give me your attention. And let's look this morning at the fearful, terrible, awful, awesome, hellish, hurtful, hateful work of sin that we read about here in Genesis chapter 3. Because what we see here is exactly how sin is still affecting the lives of people. Now I said we're going to deal with the negative this morning. We're going to work from the negative to the positive. So walk with me this morning. Let's take those steps this morning and... We'll begin on that negative side and, and look at that and then we'll come back this evening with the Lord's help and take the positive steps this morning. Let, let, let's take, first of all, uh, the, 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 a step that tells us that man's sin turns to guilt here. Verses 6 and 7. The, the subtlety of Satan led Eve to doubt, led Eve to deny the command of God, and finally deluded her, brought her to a place where, where she was totally deluded as far as sin is concerned. And what happened? She sins. Sadly, in leading Eve into sin, the devil not only made a sinner out of her, but he turned her into a seducer, if you, if you will. And she gave her unto her husband, and he did eat, and Adam also became a sinner. It's important to notice that Adam was not deceived. Let me say that again, men. It's important to notice this morning that Adam was not deceived. The fact is, Adam sinned with his eyes wide open. 
I don't know all that's involved here, but uh, in my own heart, I, I believe that uh, it's very possible seeing the woman he loved in her fallen condition, deceived by Satan, disobeying God, knowing that there was no way he could bring her back to innocence again, and loving her as he loved her, that Adam deliberately stooped down to where she was to become like her. Whatever the case, Adam's sin was far more serious than that of Eve's because it was to him, the leader of the family, that God had given the command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the man and woman, God's creation, created, the Bible tells us, in the image of God, placed in God's beautiful paradise with everything they could ever desire. They disobeyed God, and man has become a fallen creature. Sin, with all of its consequences, has entered the human bloodstream. What I want you to notice first here is that their sin brought guilt into their lives. Two things that I want to emphasize about this guilt this morning. First of all, I want you to notice the process involved. Look back at verse number six. The Bible says the woman saw the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They have willfully disobeyed God, and now they both have a sense of shame, a sense of guilt that, that has come in their lives. This is something that they have never experienced before. Why? Why? Why now? After they've sinned, do they feel so naked? What is it that's made them aware of their nakedness here? Well, let me say it's not that they were not clothed before because they, they were clothed with a different garment before. I believe they were clothed with a garment of glory and light before the fall. That's the way God covers himself in, in Psalms 104 and verse 2. Speaking of God, the Bible says, who covereth thyself with light as with a garment. Our Heavenly Father wears a robe of light, a robe of glory. And when He appears, He appears in this world as the Shekinah glory. If you remember in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, when Jesus was transfigured, the Bible says... His raiment became glistening white, as bright as the sun. The verse literally says his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. In Psalms 8 and verse 5, as God talks about man, he says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. So here was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden as God had created them. And they were enveloped in glory, wearing a robe of unspoiled purity and light. But now they have sinned. And when they sinned, they fell short of the glory of God, and the glory has departed from them. And now man sees himself as he really is. He's conscious now of his guilt and of his shame and of his nakedness because the glory of God has departed from him, and now he feels the shame. If you look back to verse 25 of chapter 2, prior to their sin, the Bible says they were not ashamed. But now their sin has turned to guilt. Now their sin has turned to shame. That word shame means dishonor or, or disgrace. Talking about bringing shame to one's family. Disgrace upon not only your life, but to those who are a part of your family, those who love you. I want to stop here and give a word of praise. Thank God for the guilt that came. Thank God for the shame that came to Adam and Eve here. You see, guilt is a, is a blessed thing in this fallen world. 
How can man ever know of his lost condition unless he becomes ashamed of his lost condition? Thank God that Adam and Eve had not become so hardened in their sin that they could not feel a sense of guilt. That brings me to a second thought here. Not only the process involved, but I think about the peril to avoid. Though guilt is a very painful thing, in so many ways it is something to be thankful for. You see, if there's sin in your life, and in your life there is guilt, what that means is that there is hope for you. If you know that, if you understand that, if you sense, if you sense the wrongness in your life, then that cries loudly that there is hope for you. Listen to the prayer of Ezra in Ezra chapter 9 and verse 6. He said, Oh my God, I'm ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Here's what he's saying. Oh God, oh God, I'm so ashamed of the way we're living. Oh God, I can't even look into your face because of how we're living. Hear me, beloved. It's not good to sin. Sin is never a good thing. But thank God for sinners who can still feel a sense of shame, who have a sense of remorse in their life. You say, preacher, why do you say that? Because there's some people in the world today who don't even feel a sense of shame as a result of their sin. Listen to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 6 and verse 15 as he talks about the people of his day. And understand, they're getting ready to go into captivity. They're just about ready to feel the iron hand of Babylon on their lives. They're just about to be taken away from their homeland. They're just about to be taken into a land where they'll be servants. They'll bow down. They'll be captives, uh, slaves to the Babylonians. They're about ready for that. Why? Because of their sin. And Jeremiah says, were they ashamed when they committed abomination, they, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. That they, they were not even sorry for their they, they were sinning and they felt no shame for it whatsoever. They had become so hardened that they had lost their sense of shame. They couldn't even blush as a result of their sinfulness. And I say this this morning with a broken heart. We are living in a generation of unblushables today. We are living in a generation that has no guilt for its sin whatsoever. Let, let me explain the, 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 the extreme peril that's involved in all this. What Jeremiah mentioned here is the second stage of depravity, no shame. The first stage is when you feel shame or guilt. You have sinned and you feel shame or guilt. The second stage is when you reach that point that you no longer sense that, that sin in your life. But let me give you a third stage. And it is the last stage. You got your Bible there. Turn with me if you would to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19. The, the, the first step is to feel shame, to feel guilt for your sin. The second stage is when you get to that point that you feel no shame or guilt for your sin. Here in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, I, I picture the Apostle Paul here, no doubt with scalding tears running down his cheeks as he speaks to God's people, looking out at some people that he knew. Notice his words in verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. That word belly means appetite. Their, 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 their God is their fleshly appetite, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame. Notice those last words whose glory is in their shame. Not only have they lost the normal sense of shame, but they actually glory in the vile things 
that they're participating in. Now I ask you this morning, are we not living in days that Paul describes here? Sin that used to lurk in the back alleys? Sin that used to, used to find darkness to abide in has moved out on Main Street today. Revealing itself on social media. Revealing itself through television, through motion pictures. Revealing itself on the pages of magazines. And re revealing itself everywhere you look today. People, people proud, yea, even arrogant about their sin today. I read that in the lobby of a hotel in San Francisco, they have a little booklet on the counter and, and several laying around on tables in, in the, the area, in the entrance to the motel. And the words on the front of that little booklet are these, where to sin in San Francisco. In other words, here's where to go if you want to go out and have a sinful time, here, here's where to go. look for that. Here are the places for you to go. Have you noticed how that any time Hollywood wants to get a big crowd, what do they advertise? They advertise sexy, sinful, lurid, shocking, shameful things, and people flock to it. I mean, they just flock to it. Why? Because they are glorying in their shame. I, I saw in the news uh, ju just, just the end of this week where the area around Stone Mountain, Georgia just elected an avowed member of the LGBT community to represent them in the state legislature. And the news channels in Atlanta, Georgia praise the vote of the people saying this, finally the LGBT community will have someone to represent them in the state legislature. What are they doing? They're glorying in their sin. What a sad, sad day, beloved, when we reach the hour when man glories in his shame. We're, we're talking about the progression of sin in a person's life. Sin leads to guilt. Guilt leads to a place where people ignore the guilt. They just push it away. And then finally that sin will lead you to a place where you're glorying in your shame. But I want you to notice something. Before we leave what Paul says here in Philippians 3, verse 19, notice the words, whose end is destruction. I pray today that if you're living with open sin in your life, that you feel a sense of shame. I have hope for you. If, you, if, if you've got sin in your life, that's bad. But if there's a sense of shame there, I, it makes me feel good when people want to down their head and you realize they're ashamed of what they're doing. I pray that you can still blush over sin. If you can't, your condition is a perilous position. And I, and I want to tell you this morning what I would do if I was in that condition. I'd get in this altar and I'd beg my way to Calvary this morning. And I'd pray for God's forgiveness and His Holy Spirit to convict my heart and help me to sense a need in my life of dealing with that sin that is contrary to the holiness of Almighty God. Adam and Eve had not reached that place. Their sin brought guilt. They knew they were naked. Can you hear, can you hear God's cry to Adam? Where art thou, Adam? Where art thou? I wonder this morning, could that be God's cry to you this morning and where you are in your individual life? Step number two as I look here, I see man's guilt gives way to deceit. Look at verses seven and eight. Let me call your attention to two things here. Sin not only makes people fugitives, it makes fools out of them. Did you know that nothing in this world will make a bigger fool out of you than sin in your life? Notice their foolish cover up. Look at verse 7 again. The Bible says, The eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked. And look at this last phrase. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. With the guilt of nakedness eating away at them, they decided to take things in their own hands and cover their shame. And the Bible tells us they took fig leaves 
And they sewed them together. And they fashioned garments to cover their shame, which is symbolic of their sin. I find it very interesting here as I, as I read verse number 7 that they used fig leaves. Fig leaves. Was it not the fig tree that Jesus cursed in the Gospels? And then if you, if you look at that passage right after that, he denounced false religion. What, what, what does all this represent? It, it represents the hypocrisy. It represents the deceit, the mockery of people who are trying to undo their sin life, to cover their sins with their own man-made garments, with their own human efforts. Adam and Eve used what was convenient to their day. And that's exactly what men are doing today. There are some who are using the man-made garment of religion, church membership, they're hiding on a church roll, church ritual, baptism, Lord's Supper, giving to the church, all those. Oh, God, you know I, I'm a Christian. I give to the church. I, I at least go once a month or uh, once a week in, in, in church. Others use the man-made garment of education. Well, uh, I, you know, I, I'm an intelligent person. I do right. I, I try to do everybody right. Others, others use the uh, man-made morality. Well, I do good things. I don't, you know, I don't drink. I don't cuss. I don't go with girls that, that chew and all that sort of thing. And, and on and on. All of those things are nothing more than fig leaves. They, they can never cover our shame, our sin, before the eyes of Almighty God. I, I thought as I, I was looking at this, it's sort of like these so-called pain creams that they advertise on television. Australian Dream, hello. You know, and you can name the rest of them up and down the line. That's one that comes to mind. You got arthritic pain, get, get you some of this pain cream and rub on. It'll take the pain away. Have you tried that? I want to tell you right now, we got a drawer, a whole drawer at my house full of that. If you're out of it, let me know. I'll bring you some tonight. It may disguise the pain for a little while, but I can tell you, honey, it will not take it away. Hello? And I can tell you, all your attempts to cover your sin will never cover your sin. Hebrews 4.13 says, uh, concerning the eyes of Almighty God, before, before whom all things are open and naked, you can't cover your sin and hide it from God. God sees through all of that. Instead of confessing their sin, Adam and Eve tried to cover it up. I ask you again this morning, can you hear the cry of God to Adam? Adam, where art thou? Are you dressed in the fig leaves of your own making this morning? Are you dressed in the works of your own hands? Titus chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 says, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear me this morning. Be done with these fig leaves. All this fig leaf junk and the, all this man-made covering in the world. You'll never cover your guilt that way. Not only do we see their foolish cover-up, but notice in verse 8, their failed concealment. The Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve, Adam and his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now it seems as you read this that uh, God walking in the cool of the day here in the garden was something that he did on a, a regular basis. May have been every day he came and walked with Adam and Eve and talked with them, fellowshipping with them. I mean, God made us to fellowship with him. God created us with an empty place in our, in our very being that can only be filled by His presence. And God, I don't know why God would desire to fellowship with something like me, but He does this morning. That, 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 that ought to humble us into the dust this morning. Evidently, He came every day and walked with them. And now, now here they are. Their eyes are open. They've tried to cover their nakedness. Wait a minute. That sounds like the Lord God in the garden again. He's walking in the garden and the Bible says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. 
not only has their sin led them to be so foolish that they thought they could cover up their sin with fig leaves, but now they've got the idea that they could hide from God behind the trees. <laughs> Whoever heard of hiding from the God of the universe behind a tree? <laughs> what a foolish thing. Did you know that all through the Bible, even this day, even at the end of time, man will still be trying to do this? In fact, in the book of Revelation chapter 6, talking about uh, the time when the Lord Jesus is coming again, that people will run to the caves and will, will cry out for the mountains and the rocks to, to cover them up. Why? Trying to conceal themselves from God. I want to tell you this morning, you can't hide from God. You cannot hide from God. You, you can't get far enough in the depths of the sea. You can't, you can't get on a rocket ship and go to a planet far enough away to hide yourself from God. Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are open and naked before him with whom we have to do, but they are hiding from God. One more thought before I close this negative part of the message this morning. I see the third step here in, in, in their sin and their disobedience to God. Man's deceit leads to separation. Look back in verse number eight again. They've sold their place in paradise. They've sold their fellowship with God. They've sold their prospects of eternal life for the knowledge of what? I ask you this morning, what knowledge did they gain? Can, can, what, what can you see different about their lives here than, than what we read about in the, in the latter part of chapter 2? I tell you, the only thing I see here is that they become aware of one thing, and that is that they're naked. They've sold, they, they have sold everything. Man, they have, they have sold paradise and fellowshipping with God and everything else. They, they have sold all of that for just one bite of a piece of fruit. Their foolish fig leaf clothing may have been good enough between the two of them to cover their nakedness, but it would never do to hide them from the piercing eyes of God. And now when they hear that familiar sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they fled and hid themselves among the trees of the garden. They've separated themselves from God and no doubt the devil and I can see the devil with a sly smile on his wicked face patting himself on the back because you see he has done exactly what he set out to do. He has driven a wedge between man and God. We see their folly, but this verse also tells us about their fear. The Bible tells us in verse 10 that they were afraid when they heard God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They had not known fear before. And now for the very first time, they feared God. Before their, but before their sin, the voice of God in the garden had brought joy in their hearts, delight. No, no doubt that time with God, that quiet time with Him, had been the best time of the day, just fellowshipping with God. But now here they are. They, they made themselves fig leaf garments. They're, they're trying to hide among the trees. They're hiding. They're afraid of God. Let me tell you this morning, God doesn't want us to be afraid of Him. God has never, God has never desired that we cringe in fear. Now, now, now that, that word fear ha has a dual meaning. It also carries a meaning of reverencing God. God always wants us to reverence Him and hold Him high. But God never wants us to cower in fear from Him. If you've got fear in your life of God this morning, could it be because sin has led you to guilt? You know you're not right with God. If you've got fear in your heart this morning, could it be because that guilt has led to deception? You're trying to cover it up? You, you, think, you, you think you can cover it up somewhere? You got that fear in your heart this morning because you know that, that, that deception has led to separation and you're not where you ought to be with God. You, you call his name, but you don't even sense that he's listening to you. Listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 59 and verse number two. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. How foolish Adam and Eve were to try to hide from God behind the trees. <laughs> what a foolish thing. But I want to tell you, that's no more foolish than you are trying to hide from God 
behind your church membership or your good deeds or, 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 or even the foolish denial of the fact that he even cares or is concerned about you. Well, God don't, God, God not even interested in me. He's got bigger fish to fry than me. I can tell you this morning, God is as much concerned about you this morning as he is the president of this United States, as he is about the, the ruler of any country in this world. God is as concerned about you as, he's as concerned about you as he was the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus when he saved him. God cares about you. In fact, he cared enough about you to send his own son to die for your sins on Calvary. I ask you this morning, can you hear the voice of God calling you? Where art thou? Could it be that you're exactly where Adam and Eve were? Sin has led you to that place of guilt. Guilt has led you to a place of deception. And that deception has led you to a place of separation. There was an old Irish doctor, a Christian man who was dying. He loved his Bible. He loved church. But he was at that point in life where he wasn't even able to get out of his house and make his way to church anymore. And one of his friends came by to visit. And as they sat and talked together, the doctor asked him if he would uh, read to him from his Bible before he left. Before he left, and the man said, "Sure, we'll read the Bible and then pray together." And the fellow wanting to read something to be an encouragement to his friend opened the Bible to John chapter fourteen and began to read. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, and the doctor said, no, stop, stop. And his friend was a little bit uh, taken back. And the dying doctor looked at his friend. Oh, he said, that's such a good word but it's not for the lack of me. Then the friend noticed a place marked in his Bible and he opened the Bible and began to read from that place that the doctor had been reading for every night for the past week. It was that passage in Luke chapter 18 where Jesus tells us what God thinks of a penitent sinner. And the publican standing afar off would not lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the doctor looked up with a smile on his face, and he said, oh, yes, yes, that's, that's the passage for doctors and ministers and lawyers and bankers and soldiers and sailors and for all the sons of men who, when they come to finish their lives, have nothing to say for themselves, but God, be merciful to me. A sinner. Aren't you thankful this morning that God is still listening for that cry to come from the lips and the hearts and the lives of sinners just like Adam and Eve, just like you, and just like me. Adam? 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 Where art thou? That's the very cry God is issuing to my heart and to your heart this morning. Will you listen for his cry? And will you respond to him this morning? Please bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. And thank you for the privilege to stand in this pulpit one more time. Father, as you've spoken to hearts, I pray there'd not be one in this building who would leave without doing business with God. I've tried, Lord, to the best of my ability to preach the message you put on my heart. Now help that one who's listened to heed it. Thank you for what you're doing even now in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? Heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. Miss Janet's going to play a verse of an invitation this morning. If you're here and you need to come, do business with the Lord, I encourage you to come right now while we wait. God's still saving old sinners. No different than He did there in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed. God's still dealing with the hearts of men this morning. Those who will listen.